Thank you so much, Murali. Now, the next speaker is a veteran in media and journalism. Edward Schumacher Matos is one of the foremost journalists, columnists, and lecturers this nation has ever seen. He was the ombudsman for NPR recently, from 2011 to January of this year, and he's currently a professor at the Columbia Law School. And in addition to that, he is also a staunch proponent of immigration rights and also fair and balanced reporting. In fact, in a recent event in the Woodrow Wilson Center, he said that in today's media, we spend way too much time on details and events instead of framing the issues based on what's most important, which is values and morality. It's a nugget of wisdom, and we're excited to hear more nuggets of wisdom for you. So please join me in welcoming Edward Schumacher Matos. Thank you. Um, let me tell you a story about a boy. Not a love story. Um, it's, but it is about a boy who had a dream. It was a dream to start a newspaper, of all things. Um, this was long ago, especially for many of you in, in your generation, this internet age, which is to say it was about 10 years ago. The boy had worked for major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post. He actually had learned about newspapers here, at the Fletcher School, at the Murrow Center, where the bug bit him to do this, and he started working part-time for a small paper, the Quincy Patriot Ledger, south of Boston. So he really felt he had the winds at his back when he wanted to find this newspaper, because only like 200 years ago, the first mass newspapers were founded just down the road in New York City when some guy had the bright idea to print penny newspapers for the masses. And then ever since then, different levels of technology were introduced. We had radio, well, actually first we had the telegraph, then radio, right, then television, and they just layered one on top of each other. And what they really did was make mass media even more mass. And they created what you might call a pipeline model for information. The barriers of entry to compete in mass media were so high, the costs were so extraordinary to buy a printing press, buy a TV station, even a radio station, were such that few people could do it. And information was controlled by either big media companies or governments. Right? And information flowed through these pipelines um, uh, and from one end were the, these producers, and at the other end were the rest of us, known as the audience. And these guys spoke with authority, and we believed them. And I wanted to be on their side. Right? But I had to raise a lot of money. Oops, I already blew the story. We know who the boy was. <laughs> but I had to raise a lot of money, and I did. $45 million. And I didn't start one paper, but four papers in Texas. They're in Spanish, but that's, that's really irrelevant for this because they served a huge underserved audience uh, the way newspapers always did, the way mass papers always did. Uh, and when we launched those papers, they had tremendous readership, far surpassed every readership goal. You know, won all kinds of prizes, but only had a problem. Money. Revenues, advertising. Something had happened between the time I first dreamed up this newspapers and launched them. Right when we launched the fourth paper, advertising for print began heading south. This was in 2005. It hasn't stopped quarter after quarter after quarter. Not one quarter since then has advertising for print even blipped up a little bit. Straight line graph down. 
my daughter, who's a singer and songwriter, wrote a song that went, you know, down, 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 down the drain. You're never going to see that money again. And there went that $45 million. Um, it was a terrific blow to my poor ego. And I decided I had to figure out, OK, what happened? And I dedicated myself to really studying about this new digital world that we live in. Of course, we had a website, like everybody has a website, just kind of nifty, but that wasn't good enough. And so when I started looking around, I discovered the issue is not, oh, the internet, oh, there's new technology. No, the issue is the whole way information and our societies are organized has changed. We've gone from this pipeline model of information to a networked model. And network models, nobody controls. I'll come back to that point. So suddenly, the people formerly known as the audience are in a way, in a way, in charge. We're kind of back to the way it was before that mass media began, where we're all informing each other. For those of you who think that, say, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal really dominate the spread of information, the average um, number for all news media, for all news media you can imagine, like 70% of the traffic that goes to, to news websites actually comes in through, through social media. And that percentage keeps going up. That is to say, people do not go to the New York Times website to read the New York Times. They really find an article that they like, either in their news feeds and Twitter or Facebook, wherever it is, or from a friend, through social media, in other words, that we're spreading amongst ourselves. So that nobody controls the information like they used to. This is not to say that the Times and everybody don't, don't have authority. They do, but not like they used to, nowhere near it. And so, you know, the mantra for what this means, this kind of new world, right, which not just challenges media companies, but also challenges governments, is that authenticity is now more important than authority. That we care more about what some citizen journalist who sees or experiences something than what some professional journalist or official tells us happened. And this happens everywhere in the world. Don't for a second think that because of what you saw in India, or what you hear about in Pakistan, or what you hear about in Africa, is any different. Technology knows no boundaries. It knows no culture. In some places, it's more advanced than others, but the impact is the same. So when I say that authenticity is more important than authority, it's such that, you know, like, for example, when there was a bombing in London of the, of the, of the, the, the subways of the tube in London, my daughter happened to be on one of the trains, one car over from one of the bombs. Thankfully, she was, she was scratched up a lot, but survived. Um, you know, the mayor of London put out a statement saying nothing had happened. And everybody on, their, on the train is sitting there with their little phones saying, whoa, 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 something's happened, there's been a bomb, da, 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 da. The mayor had to retract his statement. Same thing happened in China. You think of the Chinese government being all powerful? It is not. When there was a big crash of, a, of, a, of, a, of a high speed trains in China. And you can go around the world and find these kind of examples. So, you know, um, it has led to this kind of growing cynicism, lack of trust in institutions. If you look at polls, say Gallup does these polls from around the world and a number of other polls that show that, for example, in the United States, one can argue that the quality of American journalism has never been better and the trust in American journalism has never been lower. It continues to go down the same way that advertising goes down. And the same thing happens around the world. Trust in institutions is a crisis. So, 
You know, you could even argue what we're seeing is a threat to the whole Westphalian order of nations that we know. I don't want to exaggerate this thing. It's still premature, right? Let's don't, let's don't, let's don't say the world has changed. Um, so if, uh, if the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, West, the, West, the Treaty of Westphalia in, 18, uh, in, in 1648 essentially established the world as we know it. It created nations and meant you respected each other's territorial integrity. What we see by ISIS is a total disregard for borders. They're leaping borders. Communication is leaping borders. To what extent are, you know, are our borders, as, as, as we know them, going to continue? These are the kinds of problems that we have, right? So, but just as there are these issues, there are um, opportunities. And they're for Fletcher, for all of us sitting here in this room. First, let's take a look at the media landscape so, you, so you can picture, let's place where Fletcher could be in the landscape today. We know the mainstream news media is in crisis. The business models don't work. The ad model does not work online. The New York Times would collapse tomorrow if it had to rely on what it makes from online advertising and online subscriptions, not to mention every other media company that we know. So um, uh, that being the case, um, uh, somebody has to begin to step into the breach for the coverage of international news. They're all pulling back from covering foreign news. All of them. BBC, you know, I mean, AP, AP, Reuters, all those are out there, but they're all suffering. They're fighting to keep this thing going. They're alive. They're not dead. Don't get me wrong. But they're suffering, and they're all pulling back. Meanwhile, meanwhile, right, you have the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, all expanding their state-owned media that's pushing a propaganda message. And the, the thing, this curious thing about what the Chinese and everybody is doing it, they're pretty good. You know, it's a, it's a subtle message. It's not a bang your head uh, with propaganda type of message. So, uh, so we have the democratic news media pulling back. We have the authoritarian news media expanding like mad, covering the world in different languages. We have the voice of America in sort of an existential crisis about its relevance, if it has any. Where then you know, are we going to come up with the kind of news that the world needs in an increasingly globalized world? From you. From each other. From the people sitting in this room, the people working at Fletcher, and the people at IR schools around the world. It is time for schools to come down from the ivory tower, to put their money where their mouth is, and begin to actually, as they do when they write op-eds, or when they do, when they act, and for places like Fletcher, which is very much a professional school, and, and professors are always going to work in and out of the government, is actually to start engaging with publics and start doing the kind of news analysis, data presentations, data dives, informing of the public that the regular mainstream media can't do. They, don't, they can, but not to the level that we need it to do. It's an opportunity for us. But not just as an opportunity, it's a responsibility. Given what's happening with democracy, given the challenges that are being faced by this, if we don't do it, we'll find that the whole system becomes undermined. Thank you.